We have tremendous resources and tremendous leadership. I think that bringing that together, we can help to chisel away at what the affordable housing situation is. Everybody wants affordable housing, they just don't want it in their backyard. I just want to have a stable environment to live where I don't feel like I'm going to lose it all of a sudden. From the Keys to the Palm Beaches, the workforce housing crisis is impacting residents across South Florida. We look at how we got here and some solutions that may help ease the strain of living in paradise. Stay with us as we dive into your South Florida. Hi, I'm Pam Giganti. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the all new Your South Florida, where we choose one important topic each month that's having an impact on our local communities. We'll dive deep into that issue, talk to the experts, and hopefully find some real solutions. This month, we are taking a look at South Florida's workforce housing crisis. Often used interchangeably, workforce housing is actually a bit different than affordable housing which the U.S. Department of Housing and Development, Urban Development, refers to as residents who spend more than 30% of their income on housing costs and are low income or below the poverty line. Workforce housing is defined as housing that's affordable to moderate and middle income residents, spending up to 40% of their income just on housing costs alone. These are employees integral to a community. Anyone from young professionals to service industry workers and teachers not able to find housing that's affordable to them and near where they work. The United Way refers to this population as cost burdened or ALICE, which stands for asset limited, income constrained, employed. Those often living paycheck to paycheck, one emergency away from financial crisis. But nowhere in South Florida is this situation more severe than in Monroe County. The latest United Way report shows a combined 42% of Keys residents are considered Alice or fall below the poverty line and can't afford basic living expenses. But these numbers still do not include the impact of 2017's Hurricane Irma, which made landfall on Cudjoe Key, ravaging much of the housing in the middle and the lower Keys. Now, as the two-year anniversary of Hurricane Irma approaches, we went back down to the Conk Republic to see how the storm's devastation has made the struggle to find affordable and workforce housing even worse. I've been here for 30-something years. I don't know if I'd be able to afford to live here right now. And I feel bad for, for people that are, you know, young families and young, 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 younger adults that are trying to make their mark here. As executive director of Habitat for Humanity of the Upper Keys, Jack Nabowski says Hurricane Irma only amplified the region's workforce housing crisis. There were some trailer parks in Key Largo and, and oceanfront property trailer parks that those trailers aren't there anymore and they're not coming back. Developers are going to take those properties and do what they can with them. There are just fewer places for our working class folks to rent. We still are struggling in the county at all levels, not just the sheriff's office, uh, police, fire, rescue, teachers, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, uh, restaurant. I don't care what kind of work you have, you cannot get and keep staff. And here's the reason why. With fewer affordable units available for people to live in, many workers are forced to relocate or commute from the mainland. That leaves employers like Monroe County Sheriff Rick Ramsey scrambling to find a solution. Probably 65 to 70 percent of my police officers and staff that work in the Upper Keys actually live in Dade County and commute into work. We're working on right now doing a 43-man bunk room build out in Key West so we have a bunk room for the men and women who work at the main jail. So they come to Key, uh, from Miami to Key West, they can work their shift, sleep over, and then go back home. If we don't make it somehow reasonable for them to get here, they're not gonna come down. People have said, well, we can, we can bust people down from the mainland to the Upper Keys for my business. It's not an ideal situation, it's really not. Oftentimes people come, think it's gonna be like they're on vacation, and then when they realize how hard it is to live here, um, they don't stay. Maureen Dunleavy is the vice president of Guidance Care Center, a behavioral health care provider in the Keys. She says since Irma, it's been tough keeping centers staffed. Since January of this year, 
um, out of 120 employees, we've had 30 resignations with about 80% of people relocating. 30 people is what I've lost since January. That's what, one fourth of my staff. But a lot of times um, employers won't interview people for positions unless they're physically here because the chances of you finding someone that is a good fit and then actually finding housing, have that pan out in a, in a realistic timeline um, is, is difficult. Making matters worse is a 1970s law known as ROGO, or the Rate of Growth Ordinance. That classified the Keys as an area of critical concern, and it gave the state oversight on development. The reason? Safety. The state wanted to keep population levels in the Keys from exploding, so it could ensure the safe evacuation of all residents within 24 hours in the event of a storm. ROGO also halts any new development in the Keys as of 2023. That's just a little over three years from now. It's simple economics. Once that happens, prices are going to continue to go up. And that means the rental pricing is going to go up. So there's kind of a dash to try and get whatever building you can done in affordable and just the market rate world. This looming building cap has left Monroe County with up to 10,000 underdeveloped lots and pending lawsuits from landowners not able to build. The year after Irma's devastating landfall, the state approved a plan to grant an added 1,300 new building permits for workforce rentals. They did so by bypassing the ROGO mandate, forcing renters to evacuate some 48 hours before a storm. So far, Isla Mirada, Marathon and Key West have all voiced interest in the initiative, but not everyone is on board. There's some citizens that are against it. And I understand the other side. And there's, you know, there's, there's pro-growth and there's anti-growth. I mean, we don't want any more growth because we're built out as it is. And, and I'm not saying that there's no validity to that. It's just everybody wants affordable housing. They just don't want it in their backyard. And while all this has yet to be decided, some residents need help now. Single mom Sandra Murphy has called the Keys home for nine years and works multiple jobs to make ends meet. I mean, I've hustled, no doubt. And if you want to be here and you and you want to stay here, you got to hustle, and you got to you got to be um, willing to work hard. I work here in this beautiful boutique, but I also drive a school bus, and I have other jobs that I do, like pet sit, babysit. It's like I've done everything here. I have a daughter here that's in school. It's a beautiful place and a great place to raise a kid here. It's safe. I know she's safe. She's got wonderful friends. And this community has been so wonderful to me because um, people have stepped in and <clears throat> been like, hey, I've got this. Can you do this? Can you help me? And I'll pay you this. And it's because word of mouth and we're so tight knit here that it's everybody just knows you and they, oh, call Sandra. She'll help you. But even with an outpouring of support from friends and neighbors, Sandra's future is in constant limbo. She's applying for a home with Habitat for Humanity in hopes of gaining some stability. I am living in a house that is for sale. And I've been like looking around, trying to find other places to rent, but everything has just gotten so high. I just want to have a stable environment to live where I don't feel like I'm going to lose it all of a sudden. But the applications for Habitat Homes far outweighs the supply. Habitat for Humanity of the Upper Keys is building some 16 units and has been overwhelmed with requests. To qualify, hopeful homeowners must meet certain criteria. Applicants must show need, such as paying too much for current housing. They must invest sweat equity, physically helping to build their potential home and they must have a combined income of at least $54,000 and be able to repay a no interest mortgage. The people that we're putting in these homes are, you know, are the bank tellers and, and the, the, maybe the restaurant manager or the firefighter that's you know, tired of commuting from Miami to, to come to work every day and, and, and the school teachers and all those people those are the people that we're really you know, addressing. So we'll probably end up with 70 or 80 applications for those 16 units. That's the hardest thing that we do, is have to tell somebody, no, that's this close. It's tough. And all of this is taking a mental toll on the community with an increase in people seeking help. 
we have a, twice as many people that are coming in in crisis or um, you know are, are dealing with um, detox issues than previously. Our suicide rate in Monroe County has doubled since Hurricane Irma. In 2018, the Keys had the highest suicide rate in Florida with 35 suicides. A stark contrast from previous years with renters at the greatest risk. So if things don't change, what's going to happen? You know, we've got the suicide rate increasing. We've got, you know, staff that are leaving. How are we going to meet the need? You know, right now we're working on some affordable housing projects. We're trying to focus on private partnerships. We're talking with the cities and counties, how we can do a build out. We're talking with Habitat for Humanity. We need to partner with the, with the municipalities to, so we can invest the money in the structure and create a sustainable opportunity for people to live here affordably for many years, raise their family and uh, become part of the community. If I don't get the house, um, I'm probably going to move. At some point you have to say, is, that, is it really worth it? And while Monroe County officials try to figure out what will work best for their residents, others across South Florida are also looking for solutions. One of Miami-Dade's biggest rental property owners, United Property Management, has come up with a plan to help both educators and active duty military members. And then up in the Palm Beaches, the Office of Housing and Economic Stability has launched a workforce housing program offering both rental units and units for sale. My name is Leslie George and I'm the housing liaison for Palm Beach County. We want to make sure that the developers are aware that when they do come into the county and they want to build any developments over 10 units, that there are some set aside for the workforce. It's a partnership between the developer and Palm Beach County. They can choose to buy out, but we're not necessarily interested in the buyout. We're interested in the units because the more units we have, you know, we can service our customers. With the Workforce Housing Program, we do have two tiers. We have the rental component, and we do have the down payment assistance component. The salary ranges from about 45000 and it goes up to 105, you know, and some change. But what we say, that's household income. In terms of rentals for workforce, we have over 900 units for rental. And for the down payment assistance, we currently have 93 units, and we have 25 homes that are under contract. We do a mandatory orientation twice a month, and that's really to get the potential homeowners educated on exactly what is workforce housing. The need is great because you know, at our orientations, we could have anywhere from eight to nine people registered, and we do our orientations twice a month. My name is Louis Mata, and I am the Community Liaison for United Property Management. We are very excited to announce our UPM Cares about educators and UPM Cares about our military. This is a program available to all faculty and staff and employees of Miami-Dade County Public Schools throughout Dade County at all of our properties. The traditional and typical requirement of rental is that you have a security deposit in the first and last month, which depending on the rental amount can be several thousand dollars. What we're willing to offer to them is no deposit payment and no administrative fees. So it's almost a sign and drive, if you will. Part of the rationale or the reasoning behind this is through our involvement with the school system, we recognize that there is a need and specifically want to keep our educators in our community. The active military program is something that we're extremely proud of. We understand the need of active military personnel. We understand the cost of moving that it takes to come from outside of the state most of the time. It can be a tremendous burden and sometimes a detractor. It's very similar, no down payment, no application fees. What I certainly hope that this program encourages is dialogue and, and action. We have tremendous resources and tremendous leadership. I think that bringing that together, we can help to chisel away at what the affordable housing situation is and come up with solutions. And we'll have more information on these projects on both Facebook and Twitter at Yourself FL. 
and here to talk more about possible solutions to South Florida's workforce housing crisis is Sandra Vesey Einhorn, Executive Director of the Coordinating Council of Broward, which works collaboratively to address the needs of the community, and Anthony Williams, Licensed Realtor and Special Projects Director for the research firm Bendixson and Amandi International. Anthony coordinates the annual Miami-Dade Residential Real Estate Study in partnership with the Miami Herald. Thanks to both of you for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, Thank Sandra, you. let's start with you. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what you guys do with the Coordinating Council of Broward and what really some of the biggest issues are that you're trying to help tackle. Great, thanks. So uh, you, you mentioned Alice. So the Coordinating Council of Broward really rallied around the Alice report and thought, okay, what sort of systemic issues are really relevant to Alice families? And of course, housing came up to the top. And what we realized was while everyone knew that we had an affordable housing crisis, there really wasn't necessarily con consensus among government, business, and nonprofit on how to address it. So the Coordinating Council has been working to bring all of those stakeholders together to say, okay, here are sort of the best practice models from around the country. Um, what do we agree on and let's move forward with that? And then things that we don't agree on, let's sort of shelf it for now. And so we've done quite a bit in that space knowing that everyone's on board and we're all moving forward together. Anthony, let's tackle a little bit about what's going on in Miami-Dade County. What are some of the problems that you've seen with the affordable housing and workforce housing crisis in Miami-Dade? Well, among the biggest challenges I've seen and that most people don't really uh, consider is that a lot of the affordable housing issue is not evident. People tend to figure things out. And so if you're not able to afford a place on your own, you end up with multiple families living together, you end up with adult children still living at home. And so you don't find homelessness but that doesn't mean there isn't still need. Uh, in Miami-Dade County, we really need a, an overarching, comprehensive approach to affordable housing, but because of the way our governmental systems are structured between cities and counties and state funding, it's really difficult to put together a plan that will really address the problem countywide. Yeah, and you've kind of worked on both ends of this issue, haven't you? Because you've worked on the political side, you worked for a congressman before, so you got to see it from that angle and that approach, and now you're doing more of the kind of public policy side. So how can we kind of bring some of this together? What kind of dialogue needs to happen so that everybody's really sort of on the same page? Because I think something you said that's really important is people don't see it. Right. You know, folks are figuring it out. So it's not as if there's this big homeless encampment in front of City Hall and somebody says, we need to solve this problem, right? So. Well, and that really is it. The primary issue is galvanizing the appropriate resources and political will. Because so much of the problem is under the radar, um, a lot of times this gets pushed to the side a little bit. Uh, one of the things that I've seen, and you mentioned that we do the annual real estate study for the Miami Herald, we actually asked real estate professionals what is the best part of Miami-Dade County for a retiree to live in, mm -hmm. just as an example. The number two answer was to leave town. Wow because it just isn't affordable, it isn't sustainable for somebody on a fixed income to rent something or, or forget about buying something in Miami-Dade County. These are the types of things that policymakers sometimes need to be slapped in the face with so that they understand the urgency of the situation. And Sandra, address that too. We were talking earlier about seniors and housing and we talked about condo conversions and we talked about um, seniors who actually own their condo outright, but then they face these issues when it comes around to maybe they have to upgrade and they just, they can't, right? Right, right. Yeah, I think people really take for granted. You know, I think housing is, is nuanced in, in a lot of ways. You know, to Anthony's point, it's not as obvious as some other, uh, you know, human service issues or economic development issues that we have. You know, you're going to pay rent, you're going to pay it first. But then you need to think about if someone's cost burden and they're spending all their money on rent, what are they not spending money on? food, health care, child care. And so specifically with seniors, when they're on a very tight budget, you know, you've retired, you, you know, in the last recession, a lot of our retirees spent all that they had. Uh, and so now they're faced with, they, they have their budget, but if you've got even just a little something that turns that budget upside down, how do you come back from that? Sure. Uh, and so a lot of our, our, our seniors are, are starting to feel that now with the 40-year assessments on buildings across Broward County and probably across South Florida. Now, you also partnered with or got information from the FIU Metropolitan yes. Center. So talk about those numbers and what you've discovered. 
So the county uh, commissions a report every five years from the FIU Metropolitan Center. It was just completed a couple months ago. And some of the most startling statistics, I think, are the fact that uh, less than 13% of Broward County households can afford the median price home. So that means 87% of Broward County households cannot afford the median price home. Think about so that for a moment. Yeah, That's a let, large let that resonate. Amount, yeah. I've, I've let that simmer for, yeah, you know, since reading about the that. report. Yeah. But then again, now, now they're renting. And when you're renting and rents are as high as they are with with you know no change in sight I mean rents rents are only increasing every day we see a new article talking about it um, you really again have to start to think about the quality of life and, yeah. and the economic sustainability right because at the end of the day the affordable housing crisis really is an economic development issue and it really affects our ability as a region and individual counties to be economically sustainable. Yeah. Uh, whether you're a low wage worker or a middle wage worker, we also find in that study that over half of Broward County workers earn between 40 and 60 percent of median income. Wow. So our, our economy is really reliant on those service sector jobs that we need every day to be able to be a destination that people around the world want to come to. Uh, you know, I always affectionately say, you know, I, I live where you vacation, right. um, but that, that dream is, is really becoming harder for, for workers every day. Yeah, and Anthony, talk about that a little bit because we, we were speaking earlier about all the people who come to South Florida to live because we don't have a state income tax, so it becomes really attractive for people. But what happens is, is we just have this bigger, bigger population and everybody's trying to look for affordable places to live, right? Well, and, and it cuts in a variety of ways. You know, it, there's the longstanding joke that the, the official bird of Miami-Dade <laughs> County is the crane. So you <laughs> yeah. would think with all of this construction of housing taking place that it would take some of the pressure off. But it actually exacerbates the situation because many, much of that product is being built for upper income people who don't live here. So you might see a luxury condo go up, and if you drive by it at night, 70% of it will be dark because they're only here for a week or two a year or a month a year. Meanwhile, people who live here you know, 12 months out of the year don't have anywhere to live. Right. So talk about what developers can do. I mean, there really needs to be a partnership. But talk, we heard from Luis Mata in the piece earlier uh, talking about United Property Management cares and what they're trying to do to get people into their units. But it costs money to build anything here in South Florida because of building codes, because of land values, yeah, right? There's absolutely no way for a private sector developer to build something that is affordable for the average person in Miami-Dade County because of land value, because of construction costs. The only way to make product affordable is to have some level of government involvement. You're either providing subsidies to build the building or you're providing subsidies for people to live there. And there are sources of revenue available to provide that subsidy but a lot of times there are choke holds, uh, choke points mm. in the funding stream. One of the things that's been in the news a lot is the fact that the state has a Sadowski Trust Fund specifically for the construction of affordable housing. And yet, year after year, you see, you see a large portion of that money siphoned off to sure. go into general revenue to balance the budget, leaving less money aside for the thing it was purposed for. Right, and then so let's, that segues into this housing trust that was approved by voters in Broward yes. County, overwhelmingly approved. Yes. Talk about that money. So I think going back to the fact that it was overwhelmingly approved, you know, we, we live in a, in a political environment where everything is so polarizing. And so I think just in the fact that 73% of voters voted in favor really shows that this isn't a blue or red issue, that everyone is feeling it, whether you're a business owner or you're a resident or you're someone in between. And so really what the trust fund was, it was a mechanism. Um, you, you said the S word, Sadowski. Uh, <laughs> you know, in, in Broward County, it's sort of a dirty word uh -huh. because you know, we, we really do miss out on a lot of those funds that are desperately needed to address our affordable housing crisis. And so the trust fund in Broward was created so that it can't be sadowski mm -hmm. uh, And so that any commitment from the current county commission, and, and they have certainly increased their commitment, which has been fantastic, goes into the trust fund and it's a lot box. It cannot be used for any other purpose other than housing. It's in our charter, which is why it went to voter referendum. So there's no way, no how, that those dollars that were budgeted for housing would go to anything other than housing. And I think that that also creates an extra sense of security for developers to see that we have local government that is taking a leadership position, is putting money towards it, and recognizes that at the end of the day, affordable housing is market rate housing with a subsidy. As Anthony mentioned, you either subsidize it on the front end to bring down the cost or you subsidize it on the back end. Right. 
The only other area that uh, local and county government could really be more proactive is that the other input in terms of cost is land value. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are still pockets of, of Miami-Dade County where there is land available that either falls under city control, county control, or a wide variety of nonprofit organizations where potentially more density could be built. Well, and we were talking about that, and we've actually had Robin Backen from the University of Miami on yes. the show before talking cool. about this land map that they have, which basically looks at the county and finds all the parcels that are available possibly right. for development, right? What do we see with that? Because there's some things that some are untapped, like maybe a church owns it or Right, and there could be some sort of creative way to maybe build on that land and put some affordable units on it, correct? So yeah, I mean, my talking points from the get-go has been, again, there's no one silver bullet to address affordable housing. It's how many tools can we fit into the toolkit? And those tools have to come from nonprofits. It has to come from the private sector. It has to come from government and also faith-based. Uh, in Broward, we don't have that comprehensive tool that Miami has yet, um, but there are. There are a number of faith-based organizations that have land and we're hoping increasingly to be able to engage them in conversation and see how much of that land might be suitable for affordable housing development and to build affordable housing while also changing the stigma, right? Because yeah. when people think about affordable housing, they think, oh, I don't want those people. Right. Um, and, but and so it's I, teachers and police officers, it's people in your community. I'm always quick to ask yeah. who are those, those people, people because right. those people are. It's our workforce, yeah. it's right. our seniors, it's our veterans, you know, it's people that so, are just graduating. It's it's you, it's, it's me, it's everybody. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate the conversation. Thank you. And thank you for joining us this month. We hope you'll join us again in October. We'll see you again next time.